happy Easter, everyone. As Unitarian Universalists, we are much more into Christmas than Easter. We love celebrating the birth of that baby and we proclaim each Christmas Eve Sophia Lyon Foz's affirmation that each night a child is born is holy. With full commitment and with full joy, we're more ambivalent about Easter. It's a tougher story. Growing up as a UU, my memories of Easter in my little fellowship and my church are much more about daffodils and baby chicks hatching, not about Jesus being murdered by the state and then walking out of the tomb. Perhaps that tomb, perhaps that tomb feels closer this year, even as the earth offers the abundance and generosity of the beauty of spring. Although if you can see behind me here in Minneapolis, we got about five inches of snow today, but it's still spring. I know it's spring and spring is always beautiful. But as we wash our hands and stay in and worry about our loved ones and our own well being and confront the flagrant disregard for the well being of vulnerable communities around the world, death feels near, breathing down our neck right behind us some of the time. For reasons I can't entirely explain, a lot of my grief about this virus in all of its aspects has been channeled into the infection and sub subsequent death from COVID-19 of singer-songwriter John Prine. His music has accompanied me for my entire adult life. For me, no one can encapsulate the human condition of grief and love and longing and joy and bewilderment about the goofiness of all of it quite as well. It's the particularity of his stories and images that take me back to his songs over and over that elicit emotion from me. And the clarity of his heart shining through those songs, his goofy, non-judgmental, compassionate heart shines with love for me through all of his songs. Now, you may or may not know about John Prine, and you may or may not be affected by his life and death. If his name means nothing to you, I invite you to think of another person who is larger than life for you, someone you haven't personally met, but whose presence reassures you, connects you to your own heart, lets you know you're not alone on the planet. Whether it's the Dalai Lama or Dolly Parton, we all treasure people who provide compasses for our hearts. Even if we never knew them, we feel that they know us. And we're gonna turn on the chat and I invite you to share the names of those people in your life who hold your heart, who give your heart a compass, who let you know you're not alone. And when these people die, we cling to the remnants they left us, whether it's poetry or music or film or teaching. That kind of grief and longing, the particularity of embodied loss, threatens to undo Jesus's disciples and the community which surrounded him. It's embodied loss. When my child was three and I was leaving yet again on another business trip, Jai cried and begged me not to go. I forced cheerfulness I didn't feel, and I said, I'll be there in your heart. And Jai said, but my heart can't smell you or hold your hand. Embodied loss. Those of us who have lost someone we love know that it is the relentlessness of the physical absence that hurts most over time. We can't pick up the phone and call them. They will never share what is transpiring in our lives as we go on living without them. Grief hurts. When someone I love dies, some part of me has a very hard time believing that they're actually dead. 
It's as if I can't really comprehend that the planet can exist without them. The very molecules of the solar system seem to need to shift and reassert their presence over and over. Part of me feels as if, if they were really dead, the world would stop. It couldn't go on. Sometimes I wake up dreaming someone I love is still here, and I have to remember all over that they're gone, and it's excruciating, and the world has not stopped, and we have to go on. So how do we go on? How do we keep people alive? This week, many other artists have been paying their respects to John Prine by singing his songs, songs that he wrote. When other people sing those songs, they shimmer with both his presence and his absence. And I ache as I listen, both with grief and joy and loss and beauty. It's so hard to accept the reality of death that the idea of resurrection can feel completely out of reach, unattainable, absurd. When I was a UU kid, I was taught that the idea of the resurrection was an expression of the longing of the people who loved Jesus, that they loved him so much they couldn't believe he was dead, and so for them he was still alive in their hearts. I learned about resurrection as a reality, not a fantasy or wishful thinking by people who were grieving. Way long ago, when I was doing an internship in 1991 at the Church of the United Community in Roxbury, Massachusetts, this was a church centered in Black liberation theology. The resurrection, the living embodied resurrection was in that community. It was in the hope of the community. It was in the love and generosity of the community. And Jesus was alive. Not some abstract, skinny, blue-eyed Jesus, not a photo on the wall, but a very robust Black Jesus. I met Jesus in that community at that time, and the resurrection has been real for me ever since. Because if the people of Roxbury, living with incessant gun deaths of their teenage sons, with police violence and AIDS and crack cocaine at that time, with incessant homelessness and joblessness and mass incarceration, poverty, the cruelty of the people in power with their policies and their practices, and all of the other crucifixions which were being dealt by white supremacy every single day, if those people could find Jesus walking down the road, could find their own embodied strength and love and power there, I'm going to believe the story that the women told who said that the tomb was empty on Easter morning and that Jesus's body was not in the tomb, that Jesus is walking around. Because ultimately it was not in church or reading scripture that I witnessed and came to understand the resurrection. It was in the lives of the gathered people. These people who had every reason to give up and live hopeless, bitter lives, instead tap into a vein of life that has made a way out of no way for oppressed people throughout the ages and around the world. The resurrection made itself visible to me in the lives of imperfect people struggling against all odds to live generous, meaningful lives, creating together a community of love and care and spiritual strength. Until that time, it was as if Jesus was an uncle who went away in the army and died. I'd never met him, but his picture was on the wall and people talked about him fondly. But in Roxbury, I came to know a living Jesus. So for me, the resurrection is a community event embodied in the relationships between a kind and just community that we long for and have yet to make. Consider these words from the Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. It's probable that the next Buddha will not take the form of an individual, may take the form of a community. The next Buddha may take the form of a community, a community practicing understanding and loving kindness, a community practicing mindful living. Maybe the next Messiah will come that way too, and resurrection happens that way too. 
May we practice resurrection every day and in all of our lives. After our service today, there will be time for those who want to gather in small groups to share. And of course, you'll share whatever's on your heart and mind. But I hope you'll also share where you have seen life come out of death, where you have seen renewal, how you practice the resurrection.